four years in Newport, Rhode Island, teaching Navy how to shoot pistols and rifles. Welcome, hello, welcome. Mr. Curry, is, it, is, it a, is it a car made of anything? Is, is this the factory? I think it's the restoration. Oh, the restoration. Okay, I'm guessing. I don't know. That's my assumption. <laughs> Come, uh, welcome to you all. Uh, please join me in our uh, Laconia Historical and Museum Society tradition of standing and pledging allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, As executive director of this society, I'm pleased to serve as your host this afternoon. Again, welcome to you all. Also, a monthly hello goes out at this time to our many friends, viewers, and members at Channel 25, Lakes Region Public Access. This uh, society endures with the help of a proactive board of directors consisting of 16 valuable members of our community. Throughout 2016 and 2017, our volunteer corps has consistently involved about two dozen dedicated individuals. Our society membership, as well as your generous donations, continue to allow us to be a viable institution. Thank you for your goodwill to date, with an assurance from us that it is indeed appreciated. For those of you who are new to our audience or are interested in membership and general help, we encourage you to leave some contact information when signing our guest book on the back table, and we'll be in touch. At this time, We'd like to thank the Laconia Public Library for their continued partnership in bringing you programming. Since 1903, this building has graced downtown as an elegant reminder of our obligations to scholarship and uh, education. Before introducing today's presentation, we'd like to update you on our 2017 exhibits located in the gallery on the top level of this building. If you haven't uh, discovered the history of rail in Laconia, please do so. We're happy to be a part of the Celebrate uh, Laconia festivities and know that uh, plans are in place in uh, late September for our next exhibit, which is the history of OPG Park and a strong programming ongoing that will include joint meetings with the Meredith and Guilford uh, societies, as well as a veterans special in November. Join us. We continue to post our past, present, and future at www.laconiahistory.org, as well as our Facebook page for your reading pleasure. The title of our talk today will be Laconia Car Company's collection of 10 historic electric railway vehicles at Seashore Trolley Museum, 1895 to 1918. In 1954, Donald Curry became Seashore Trolley Museum's first paid employee. Mr. Curry worked in the museum's restoration shop during the summers he was attending Boston <coughs> University, from which he graduated with a degree in music education. While he taught for 29 years and played bassoon for the Portland Symphony Orchestra for 25 years, he remained involved with the museum during his vacations. When he retired from teaching in 1989, he became the museum's director for nine years, 
then returned to his roots as a restoration shop employee. Now officially retired as a museum employee, he continues to volunteer and is currently engaged in a project to expand the documentation of his considerable knowledge of the restoration of electric railway vehicles. Our other speaker, Don Fillmorse, a 25-year member of the New England Electric Railway Historical Society, is owner-operator of Seashore Trolley Museum in Kennebunkport, Maine, and the National Streetcar Museum in Lowell, Mass. Has served the society over the years as a trustee, president, CEO, executive director, director of community relations, uh, appointed liaison to the Theodore Roosevelt Association, as well as project manager for various society programs. Currently serving as primary mover for the $500,000 Narcissus Restoration Project. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming uh, Phil Morse and Don Kerr. Thank you. Um, on behalf of uh, Seashore Trolley Museum and New England Light Railway Historical Society, uh, we uh, commissioned an original work of art that you see here of one of the Laconia built cars uh, that's on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it's part of the Portland Lewiston Development System. And this car was built uh, in 1912 here in Laconia. At the, uh, gentleman who uh, built the line and uh, personally appointed the interior of these cars uh, wanted to have people have a personal relationship, uh, not only the riders, the passengers, but the people who worked for the line. So he named each of these cars after flowers that he really enjoyed uh, from Maine. So this is the Narcissus portrayed in this image. And uh, I want to uh, give a, a copy of that image uh, to the Historical Museum uh, on behalf of Seashore Trolley Museum. And uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. <laughs> this is very nice. uh, While we're uh, putting pieces together here, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and just talk about some of the things that are on display here uh, from the Narcissus. Um, You'll hear from Donald, he's going to do the presentation uh, on the 10 cars that we have in the massive collection at the Trolley Museum, which includes uh, over 250 electric streetcars and work cars from, uh, from all over the world, uh, along with, uh, we're a mass transit museum, so we have more than 60 buses and also uh, 15 trackless trolleys. So it's a, a massive collection. We also have buildings, actually, uh, copper-clad buildings from uh, Boston, from 1901 that were part of the uh, elevated system uh, back then. Uh, the two-story uh, Tower C, which actually came up by barge, Kenny Bunk Fort uh, in the 80s. And then we have the whole Northampton Station, all copper clad, that's uh, on campus along with other buildings uh, as well. So it's a massive collection on 300 acres of land in three different towns. And uh, we offer public rides. So once we restore a particular car, uh, they are available uh, for people, visitors to come that pay admission to go for a ride. Uh, if you're a volunteer like myself, uh, you have access uh, not to just drive them around. <laughs> uh, you, you're able to see them and work on them and, and actually uh, spend a lot of up close and personal time with them. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about right now is, in particular, the Narcissus. And as I said, it was built in 1912 here in Laconia. It's one of four. Uh, cars uh, of that order, uh, all named after flowers that were built here in 1912. And the order was number 661. I did some research with Pat yesterday in the archive, which was awesome. And it's order 661 from April of 1912, which happened to be the same month the Titanic set sail and sank. And also the same month that uh, Fenway Park opened for a few Red Sox fans. So, uh, it's an important month, uh, also in electric railway history. As I said, the Narcissus is on the National uh, Collection uh, of, of National Historic Register. It uh, has been, along with nine other main vehicles, uh, three uh, of which are Laconia built. Um, and the Narcissus uh, is a high speed interurban. And so the fellow who built the private right of way in the line is about 32 miles long. 
and he was a successful businessman out of Lewiston, Maine. And he wanted these he, he wanted these cars to really be the cat's meow. And he had them. They have uh, 40 lead stained glass windows, which have all been restored. I, I sorry, but they've all been restored, and they're all in mahogany sash. And actually, they're all at my house. <laughs> Except for these few who are here right now visiting us. Um, and I, what I like, one of the things that really drives me uh, with the museum and doing these restorations, that I like doing the research and finding out the uh, side stories and uh, backstories. And so the woman that we contracted to do the professional restoration is glass, uh, because some of the pieces, of course, were broken and lost. And, uh, a couple of the windows were, were gone as well. And she found through her research uh, that the two, there were two different glass companies that made this glass. One company uh, had this, supplied this glass, the darker glass, and in the larger window, uh, the other company supplied this light green and this cream colored glass. And both those glass companies are still in business today. And, and on their shelf, they had actually uh, new old stock of this order from 1912. So, so even the glass we use to replace uh, missing glass or broken glass, the glass is actually original, new, old stock from the original glass oh, company from 1912. It's going to come in from the back, so, so like, like this. So if you're on the uh, outside, you know, as, you're, as the car is going by, especially if it was in the city of Portland or in the city of uh, Lewiston, uh, at nighttime, this is what you would see from the outside. Uh, inside, it would be, uh, because the lights would be on inside the car often, um, it would really take strong street lights uh, with the inside lights being perhaps uh, down, but uh, you'd really get, uh, I think as an outsider looking in, so to speak, uh, the car, you'd really get the, the uh, essence of the uh, how romantic. Now, the interior of the car is all mahogany interior with inlay, and the, the ceilings are all um, with floor de lis and uh, gold leaf. And uh, you, you know, after the program, you'll be able to come up and see some of that beautiful gold leaf. And uh, we'll be doing that. The, the fundraiser we've done currently, uh, we've raised enough, uh, over $100,000, so we can complete the exterior restoration of the car. And uh, the fundraising now is for the interior. So there are 50, uh, 22 seats to hold 44 people. And those seats are transverse, so you can switch them to go in whichever direction. And it's a plush green. Uh, and we have some of the backs, uh, but we don't have we don't have really the pedestals or any of the other seats. Uh, and the reason is because the body of the car was a summer camp for 35 years at a lake <laughs> up in central Maine. Uh, and fortunately, the fellow who bought the body of the car in the late 30s paid $100 for the body and uh, used it for his summer camp. And we're very fortunate that uh, one of the children, one of his children that grew up in the car, uh, shared uh, photographs with his family photos from inside the car. Uh, he, he, actually, this is Daniel right here, and his uh, wife, Rose, they've been married uh, over 50 years now, but when they were first dating, and he first uh, introduced Rose to his parents, they were living inside the Narcissus. <laughs> so that's where they, they first met, was inside the Narcissus. And what we did last year, we do uh, annually, we do a fundraising weekend uh, uh, for the car. And the Friday night is a, a ticketed, you know, we have speakers and so forth. And Dan was uh, this one of the key speakers last year. And he talked about what life was like growing up living in the car as a young kid uh, with his brother. And uh, what we were able to do uh, at the stage of restoration, we were able to uh, put the smoking compartment together with the stained glass windows and many of the restored uh, mahogany pieces in the smoking compartment and do photo ops uh, for the folks that attended the Friday night uh, program, uh, which was really special. And uh, we had uh, the 26 leaded stained glass windows in the clear story, which is the upper roof section of the car. So people that came to visit could really get a sense for what's to come as we complete the restoration of the car. Um, and you will see some pictures <laughs> that Donald will show uh, later of uh, what they look like during that process of restoration. And uh, you may be shocked uh, at how, uh, how, how bad they look when they first <laughs> start their restoration. 
Uh, and what I can tell you is that the, the trolley museum uh, staff and volunteers, when they see this uh, skeleton or see where the roof is gone or the floor, you could walk through the floor, the things that are really challenging about it from a physical standpoint, um, that's not what we see. What, what we see is the beauty of what is going to be uh, when it's completed. And, and that's, that's, these are long, complicated um, uh, processes to find uh, for these National Register cars, you have to you have to exhaust all avenues for old growth lumber. And so, uh, for instance, there's a lot of poplar on the Narcissus, on the exterior of the car. I think it was just uh, inexpensive wood that was readily available. So there's a lot of poplar, but it's in many, many different shapes and forms. So this is one of those poplar pieces. And this is what the stained glass piece fits into, but this is on the exterior of the car. So it's uh, up here, over the, that's what holds the large, so on the exterior, it's right here, this piece right over, right over here. And so this is all poplar, but it's cut in so many different ways to fit in so many different things that it's really complicated. And because it's two halves, it was cut, each half was cut out of one board very thick board. And so you have the grain of the wood all going in the same direction. So every single arch of this exterior poplar uh, failed down here. And the, the saving grace was that there was one right side that had the two or three broken pieces that were still nailed to the body, and one left side that was still nailed to the body. So they could carefully nail, you know, take the nail out, glue, and, and the volunteer, bless him, uh, who's a fine uh, furniture maker, was able to then have a template to make uh, two complete sets because as a summer camp, they had an addition, a kitchen uh, that had a buck stove in it. So that's, that was how they heated the car. And so they removed these from those uh, two areas where the, the addition was. And then, um, so what the volunteer did was he measured the highest break point on the original sash, uh, original arches that were there, and then he cut them all at the same height, and then he made uh, from this old growth poplar that we found in a, a bank barn in Pennsylvania that was being raised from the 1800s, and there was one center beam holding up a floor that was 20, uh, 15 feet tall and 22 inches across, and then a sleeper beam uh, that was 60 feet long, massive log poplar. And so, truck those to Maine, and then we put in an order for Donald would assess the thicknesses of these things, and then send the order off to our, the reclaimed lumber person who we contract to find this, this wood for us. And then he has a mill cut the, the base that we need, and then our volunteers will take that. And in this particular case, because we want to save as much of the original material as possible, he was able to um, make finger joints and, and save all of this. And from that old growth uh, poplar from Pennsylvania barn, was able to put a blank on here. And then he has uh, three different, I'm going to call them jigs, I'm not a, a woodworker person, but three different jigs that you would put the half, a left and a right in, and then go through and plane it down to make all these intricate. And, and, and so we had hundreds of hours, of volunteer hours, repairing each of these little tiny corners. And then the two complete ones, he had to make all these cuts and round it here and cut here and round in the back. And, oh dear. So, so the average person that comes as a visitor to the trolley museum, they pay their uh, admission, they go, they get their ticket, and they, they get into one of these beautifully restored cars. Uh, one of the common ones is, say, a 1905 uh, uh, closed car from um, uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And it came as a complete operating car in 1948. Or it might be one of the sister <coughs> open cars from 1901 or 1905 that have been restored. And people come and they look and the, they're sitting and riding in this restored, you know, historic, beautiful craftsmanship work, going, wow, this, this probably took a long time. You know, this talk, you know. But you don't really have any idea how much time <laughs> it takes uh, until you kind of get up and close. So as a project manager for the Narcissus, what I've done is sort of push myself uh, with, with help from museum professionals saying, uh, Phil, you have all this information, you have all this, you know, uh, 
uh, exposure to all the wonderful stuff that's being done by these museum staff and, and, and uh, volunteers, you need to get that word out there so people really start to understand how, how, uh, how much it takes to make this stuff happen over a period of time. So, so I, I, I started, well, someone helped me start because I didn't know how to start, a, a blog. So the Narcissus has a blog. <laughs> and now I'm the I'm the blogster. Yeah. <laughs> and so I so so my my spelling sometimes is questionable. My grammar sometimes, well, quite often is questionable. But what's un, un you know questionable is is the passion I have for the project. So what I would do is get permission from the dear volunteer who does this stuff in his shop at home, because that's where his professional shop is. Uh, I mean. The, the level of work he does, he was contracted or commissioned by Harvard University. Uh, they, just a couple years ago, finished up uh, the renovation of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's dorm living space from, you know, early 1900s. And they had replica furniture made of that original furniture. And, and this fella from Scarborough, who was one of our dear volunteers, was contracted to make that stuff from scratch. Unbelievable. And, and he does this for us, so we are so fortunate to have volunteers that will do that. So he let me uh, take pictures and video of that process. So I have like a series of four vlogs that have the pictures and the video showing him do this. And then you look at that, you really start to like, wow. The, the wow factor is like really impressive. So, so I encourage you to uh, take one of my business cards, Follow the blog, look at that stuff, because I have well over a hundred blog posts, over a hundred thousand uh, page views so far. Because I talk about the fellow who built the line, the Roosevelt connection, because he was a passenger on the car, the museum connection, the work that's being done on the car. I, I just am fascinated with all the connections. And so Laconia Car Company, of course, is part of it. So I have a blog of each of the ten, um, well, seven of the cars at the Trolley Museum that have been restored or are in restoration that are Laconia cars, like the Narcissus. And there are three that have not been restored. And so that's one block, because there's not a lot of information on, on them yet. But, uh, so I have some things that are for sale today at the end when we're done. Some books that are signed by all the authors that are Roosevelt-connected books. Um, and we have prints of this work that was just commissioned and released on the 21st of July. Uh, along with some greeting cards, and all of 100% of the proceeds from all that uh, go to the restoration project because an anonymous donor has um, funded all the purchase and making all that stuff. So your money that goes buying this stuff, 100% of it goes toward this restoration project. So with that, I'll uh, put this weapon away, and I want to introduce uh, Don Curry. So you're, you're ready, you think? Well, I thought you'd never get there. <laughs> <laughs> he was vamping while they did the tech. Okay, hold on one second. Just See? plug in one more. This, this is Donald's significant other, Denise. Thank you, Denise. Well, yes. Thank you for everybody else. Thank you for the patience. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, enjoy the show. And I'm gonna <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna do the um, the thing. So if it goes too fast, it's my fault. One of the things I used so, to do. So is this is Don Curry. Extraordinary. Thank you. All right. I know you're ready. Thank you. All right. One of the things I used to do as a, when I was a director of the trolley museum, we did a thing called the ghost trolley, in which uh, we went around to all the <laughs> elementary schools in the fourth and fifth grades, and uh, I talked to them about this boy that had gotten on a trolley, and it went off somewhere to the end of the line and was never seen again. The point of it is I did slideshows in several rooms, one right after the other. I could come in, now this is, remember slides, remember those things? Yeah. 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 We never well, had this problem. Yeah. When, I came in, yeah. when I came into the classroom, three minutes later we had the program going. So, uh, I love electronics, but there are better ways. <laughs> so let's see what's going on here. Oh, i got to ask you this. Now, I know there's nobody here old enough, but just in case, who has ridden a real trolley car in a real operation somewhere? Look at all those old people. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see what's what. This stuff, uh, there was a publication called the Street Railway Journal, which came out every week for uh, from about 1892 all the way up until 1942. 
and in it were articles on the various car building companies. This West End Street Railway was Boston, but this is what they made it out of. Poplar, ash, southern yellow pine, and so forth. And here's another article uh, of this. They, they were all very much the same, very well built. Okay. And this is the paint shop. I don't know whether she was looking at that guy standing up on top of the roof, but even as the museum, we have to think about that. And when it's done, this is what it looks like. They call the Boston Standard because they had hundreds of these, built many by Laconia, also built by a, a J.G. Grill Company, Bradley, Blossom, all kinds of builders. But this was what they looked like, at least for an 1896 car. Okay? So Seashore Trolley Museum cars, Phil has referred to the Laconia built cars, and we have them in various state condition. And it gives you hope. Some of them are pretty good, and some of them are not very good. Well, let's see what we can find. This is the 1895 car from Manchester, New Hampshire. It was used as, as a passenger car for many years, and then it became a sand car. And they had little sand chutes which would drop uh, sand on the rail, which would be slippery on a rainy day. They preserved that car, and in 1940, they, they quit uh, running cars in New Hampshire, in Manchester, and we bought from them the car for something like one dollar. The wheels were too expensive for us. We couldn't buy them. We had to get a set from New, uh, Portland. So that car is now at our museum. But it doesn't look quite like that. Okay. But inside, it has traces of the beginning, uh, untouched, in 75 years. I went in there the other day. It was just like going back in, in a time machine. This is the only painting that was done on the car after it came to us. Okay. Done. Done. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to use this? Can you? Can everybody hear him? Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. No, we can hear. Okay. Well, if you can't hear me, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> I can see pretty well. Go ahead. And one of the things that they used to upholster streetcars seats with is mohair plush, and that's uh, the original 1895 plush right there. Okay. This car is from the Mass Northeastern Street Railway. It was uh, a house, uh, I think it had something to do with a children's camp down near Salem, New Hampshire. Came to us in that condition, but there's some nice details. I don't know whether you can read it or not, but it's the Laconia Car Company. Uh, you'll see this uh, appearing in various forms on several of our cars. So this one does need a little work, okay? <laughs> this is the inside. Two, uh, the, they're both organ, pipe organ builders uh, professionally. And this is looking at the details that are in the side of them. Trolleys, just like this building in that era, just couldn't wait to put something in the blank spaces. Okay. This one is uh, from the Nor. Uh, what am I thinking of? Anyway, it's from Providence, uh, Newport and Providence. And it was an open car, but it's not quite as good as it used to be. Yes, this is it coming to us after we've been sitting outside in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, marinating. Getting, we, we don't want something that's too easy to work on, so we have to marinate it a little bit. Okay. This is what it looks like. The other day, they, I found the car had been covered up when I went to take more pictures, so at least we're taking care of it. We're preserving the option. And this is a car from Boston, which served as a work car, about 100 and a little older than this building, uh, from Boston, Massachusetts, okay? Here's a car from where? Local Laconia car, available for the askings. Hurry up right now before somebody gets and takes it away from us. Something you'd like to get started on there? Yeah. <laughs> now we have a, yes, yeah, somebody has personal experience to that. Where did she go? She shares. Her, her grandfather was an operator of that. So they used to run right down, there she is, I, what I used to run right down the street in front of here. This is a car from Manchester, New Hampshire, built, <coughs> built here, went from Manchester to Nashua, okay. This is what it looks like inside right now. Those are all seats that we reupholstered. We had to find a place to get the, uh, the mohair plush. It was made down in North Carolina, and now I don't think you can get it even in the U.S., okay. 
they always had this real gold leaf on the, that. Most of the castings that you see are brass or bronze. Okay. And here is a builder's plate, solid brass. And over here, when you went into the car, they had a, boat, a, a vestibule outside where the motorman ran the car, and there was a door behind him. And you could, didn't go out there. If for some reason a somebody should sneak on there with a motorman, the conductor came up here, slid this over, and put his hand in there, fares please, and then, then put it, slid it back. So that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a car from the Pull Drag and York Company. Pull Drag and Yank, I should say. Portsmouth, Dover, and and um, I have Parkinson's, by the way, and I have gaps. I can't help it. Portsmouth, Dover, and York Street Railway. That says we finished it. This is how we finished it as a post office car. And this is how it appeared in 1947, just before we got it over in Sanford, Maine. We drove right by where this place was this morning. Okay? Well, it had an interesting life. It was a mail car. They actually had uh, sealed in the center of the car, with no doors on, on the end, where the mail clerk put the mail and they delivered it, picked it up in uh, Portsmouth, and took it up to uh, Gunquit Wells and so forth. This, here it is when it was first built, and they had trouble with the maintenance of the track down in New York, Ray Boat Harbor. <laughs> they did put it back together, and it still runs. We have it at our museum. Okay? This is one of our most interesting cars. It, again, we went right by where it ran uh, on the Atlantic shoreline, which is where our streetcar line is now built. And it ran down in the mills. Uh, I don't know whether Laconia's mill buildings were quite as big as this, but uh, I've been by there, and they're just tremendous. And the only way they could get stuff in and out was by rail. This is what it looked like in about 1947, just before we got it. It's made out of southern yellow pine framework, big pieces which we essentially glued together between glue and epoxy. We were able to put that car back together again. This gentleman is a pattern maker for uh, set designs for displays. And his great grandfather used to run the, the trolley company. He was in the administrative office. Okay. Here it is, all finished. Whoops, we're going around the loop. When we go around the loop, the wheels, the trucks twist. And as they twist, they're no longer in place. When you put the car together and everything was in a straight line. We're finding that there's a pipe down here which isn't letting the car go any further. That was the test run. And so we had to go back and forth and cut some pipe and move some things. But it is running. And that white disc says Laconia Car Company, 1906. Okay. Oh, what a pretty looking streetcar. <laughs> My friend Mr. Webb here has quite an interest in that. that this yellow paint and a lot of work. A lot of elbow grease went to making it look as it does right now. This is from the, uh, the uh, Bay State Street Railway, ran all around outside of Boston. Then it went down to Newport, Rhode Island. Then it went down to New Jersey, where it became a house. You'll see a couple of pictures. We're picking it up with a crane because it didn't have any wheels under it. This is what it's like on the outside, OK? It was kind of sagging on the end, so we had to help that up, OK? And several years later, a little bit better, yes, we're, we're very close. <laughs> they, they, and they were working on it yesterday. There's a big thing called the fender that goes on the front that flops up when it's at the back, when it's, when it's on the front, it's down here like a great big, uh, I don't know, sort of a wire mesh. And it's to sweep up the pedestrians off the road in front of us. <laughs> and the inside is all done. The uh, seats on this are upholstered with rattan and specially made for us in China, okay? Here's four generations, well, three generations. The fourth generation must be looking over there, over his father, his son, and daughter and granddaughter. Uh, they were, there's a four-generation transit-related family, okay? The Eastern Mass Street Railway. This is our car, our shop, where we work on them. We tear them right down to practically nothing and hopefully back together again. 
My problem is I'm not remembering what I did yesterday. I don't know how I'm going to remember what we did three weeks ago and so forth. So, Pictures. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. And this is taking place right in the Laconia car shop. This is what... Oops, I'm sorry. Well, back it up. It shows the, the working conditions that were in there. I was surprised there was an electric drill that was in use in that day. Uh, I didn't think they had stuff like that. This is a semi-steel and wood car. Okay. Let's take a ride on the Portland Lewiston. I'll move it along as fast as I can. Does anybody have to leave at a specific time here? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go fast. There's the Narcissus with an advertising uh, plate that they put in all its stations. And notice, the, what's the significance of no cinders? Where'd that come from? No steam. Steam, steam, steam engines. Steam. When I was a kid in Schenectady, New York, I can remember Sid, the electric locomotive, the uh, American locomotive company was over there, and I would forever be pulling the cinders out of my eyes because it was. Some, some of us missed that, though. Don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and this is the where it went. The green line is the Portland Lewiston, about 30, 30, what? How many miles still? About 32. Okay, 32 miles. Okay. So here is the motorman and the conductor. These were all two man cars. Two man cars. Remember that. Yes. Women, <laughs> women were not capable of doing such things in some people's mind. Okay. This is just going north of the Coal Farm Restaurant in Gray, Maine. There's the bridge that was left behind. Okay. This is down the road a few miles in Falmouth, Maine. It's a little trace of the railway. And this, the railroad went straight ahead across the steam line here, which goes down into Auburn, Maine, okay? And this is where we talk about how fast the trolleys would go, going down the hill, and, it, and it, I'd say 45. Phil comes up with figures in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> they went fast, anyway, okay? And they had power substations they had to run through a thing called a rotary converter to take the 13,000 volt AC power from the generating station down to 600 volt direct current that the trolleys ran on. This is in <coughs> West Falmouth. Imagine something like that coming rattling up to you. I'm impressed with the fact that you had trains running here, but it wasn't exactly uh, quite the same as you ride in a car like that. They, in fact, I was wondering if there was something wrong with it because it was moving so slow. But I guess the law is on their sides, is that the problem? Okay. This we found uh, in a farm not far from where the trolley line used to operate in Gray or New Gloucester, Maine. And it looks like something you'd find next to the gas stations of those years. But this is a genuine Portland Lewiston uh, station. Okay. This is downtown in Port Portland, Maine. They went around the circle in front of Monument Square. Okay. This, uh, you wouldn't know that, This I also show this down in Portland, but this was the, the car barn for the Portland, in Portland, okay? This was what spelled the end of the trolleys. They built a beautiful, brand new, paved railroad, and you could go any time you wanted. You didn't have to wait 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour for a streetcar. You could just go. And so, in 1933, that was the end of it. But... When it was running, they were beautiful. Narcissus, Magnolia, Clementus, Magnolia, all those flower names, and accompanied by that beautiful uh, stained glass that Bill, Phil showed you, and there was gold striping uh, and gold letters everywhere. Okay? Now, this is the exact description of this car. Double truck, railroad roof, wood, high speed, 600 volt, direct current, electric, standard gauge, interurban trolley car with arched stained glass window sashes. <laughs> so we have to describe, yeah, I can't always do that. <laughs> okay. This is comparing our trolley with uh, some other ones. This one was built by the Watson Car Company in Springfield, Massachusetts, and it's uh, very close to the Narcissus in the way it made except the windows in the top were just plain glass, not like this, okay? 
but when you put the right kind of uh, marine grade paint on it, it comes out pretty well. Okay? That's the builder's photograph, and that's the Wasson Car Company in the background. I understand you have a, a uh, smokestack, something like that, in Laconia. <laughs> Somebody going to show it to me? They were talking about it. Doesn't it exist still? I'll show you that. Okay, don't forget. Okay. Here is that. Uh, we saw this before, showing you a car as it ran out through the countryside between Man Manchester and Nashua. Okay. Who's that? Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. There's a sort of an arrow you can see it. He's pointing at his head there. Uh, that was uh, one of the. His, he was traveling from two political functions uh, outside of Portland. Okay, so that's why some of us have been made to wear things like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a very interesting combination. I have bought a lot of those Teddy books. I always, I love to read books. I'm reading Carl Sandburg right now, his biography. But I read all the books that you had on Teddy Roosevelt, and it was just fascinating. Okay? The uh, headlights had to be arc headlights, like they used to use in theaters. Okay? And the conductor, what a handsome fellow he was. The brass buttons of the women uh, just fell in love with him. This is the crew that kept the cars going. This is the last day. She is the uh, mother, is it? Oh. Daughter of the owner of the trolley company. And they're about to take the last trip. Just 20 years. That's all that lasted. Okay? And if we had only had the money then, we could have had it for practically nothing. But we didn't. Okay? And then we almost, okay? We almost had a chance. This is in Camp Ellis, Maine. Mrs. Anthony, who was the one who owned the land and who uh, was the daughter of the owner of the trolleys, had a piece of property at Camp Ellis where that arbutus was brought and put down, left there uh, as if it could run the next day. It had uh, a tin building they put over it for a while. But sometime toward the end of the war, uh, some people came, well, she was talking with some people who were members of what was the trolley club at that point, and they uh, said, you know, we'd really like to have that car. She said, uh, I think maybe it's time to help out the war effort. So this ended up in Japanese scrap, and it was perfect, ready to run, all there. So we have a little bit more difficult job, which we'll see in a little while. We don't know who this young fellow was, but it's just if we had only known the amount of work it would take, and you'll see that. The Narcissus of Story still being written. This is, it was taken alongside the road, actually the, right next to a trolley track that was still active, and it was moved to one side and put up on blocks, and first of all became a sort of a diner, and then as you'll see, that it became a uh, home for the Valley family, so Aspen, it looked, how it looked when the trolley fan said, came beside when Mr. Valley was working, he said, I'll work on it. And they said, don't do anything to it to hurt it because we're going to get this someday. Now this is probably 1945. Okay. And so he put aluminum on the outside. There's the windows. There's the Valley family all crowded right inside the car. And this is Mr. Valley who called me up two years, two, three years ago, and he said, without introducing himself, he said, I want to see that car with my bedroom in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he came down. He's a wonderful, wonderful man and supports the project, gives some insight, though he was young and the car uh, was old, so he didn't know it firsthand, but he, he's been very supportive. Okay? So we're getting it ready. It's, it was on concrete blocks. We're moving it over to one side. Okay? getting ready to move. My son is 56 now, <laughs> and he remembers all. He, I had two boys who are engineers. Both love to work for the Trolley Museum, and that's why they're successful engineers, making more money than I ever thought of as a teacher. And their sister, uh, my daughter, uh, was a, is a teacher of English, but she also worked, and she now owns a big, very expensive house, which she can take care of because of that. So. And some of these other kids were uh, kids in my high school band in Cape Elizabeth that I taught. And I see them frequently 
and they are all just remember what they did. It was a wonderful time. Okay? That's the roof trusses for the house. Okay? Now, I don't know what happened to this, but it doesn't, it doesn't show up. But basically, Mr. Valleys said, if you'll give me a house that is of equal value in size, to, not equal value, but equal in size to uh, my apartment that I have, I now have emphysema. I can't walk up the three stories. Will you, will, if you give me a house, I'll give you the streetcar, which is what he did. So here it is on what we call the highway monster. It followed its own, the old trolley route from where we saw the pictures where it was down through Lewiston and Gray and Portland to where it ended up at our museum. Okay, Getting ready to put the wheels called trucks underneath. Okay, And that message just was describing where the car went. Okay. All right. Okay, we have it. What can we do with it? Well, here are three cars, which I talk a little bit more about, that have gone through various stages of our restoration process. The Atlantic Shoreline Railway. Notice the amount of wood that is in that. Where we might use an I-beam, they use a rod, or just an inch, inch and a half diameter rod, the whole length of the car, and uh, surrounded by wood. So this was back in 1947. Outdoors don't do it very good. Let's see what we could do to it. Oh, well, first of all, we're going to run it into our car barn. Looking as bad as it did, we were actually able to move it while under its own power. Okay? And here it is inside of the shop, Just and we're taking the, some of the parts of it off. We take the cab off the back, we took the front off, and I would say about 50% of the car is new. Or not new, it's recycled wood, I should say. We have a, a, something that we hate to have in restoration is exfoliation. Anybody know what that is? You're shaking your head. What's one word for exfoliation? Sloughing off. One word. Rust. And rust is oxygen and Fe three O four or F. And you get more volume because there's a lot of water that was incorporated chemically into the into the fashion there. So we oh you gotta move something. Uh oh. You're doing so well. All right, well uh, I'll move on. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, were all trolley cars um, standard gauge? No. Everything in Maine was, and New Hampshire that I know of was standard gauge. Four foot, what, anybody know the dimension? Four feet, eight and a half inches. Very good. I knew you know. Okay. <laughs> and our track is that too. We have a trolley from Los Angeles, California, and that is three foot, about three feet and a half. We have one from Toronto that's five feet in diameter. We have some in Philadelphia, Baltimore, which are slightly different. And uh, so that's. Uh, a little bit of a problem. We have regaged a few of our cars, but we can't do them all. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, who built the motors? General Electric or Westinghouse. They Don, quite Don, often would split Get to the microphone. Answer the questions of the microphone. Did you say spit into the microphone? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too hard. I'm, I'm sitting there. Right <laughs> General Electric and Westinghouse were the major builders. You could also have asked about the controls on the cars. And most of the controllers on cars were made by General Electric. But some of them said Westinghouse on the ones that GE made. There was some collusion going on there. And I don't know whether it was legal or what. The car, the Portland Lewiston car will have GE motors and Westinghouse control the way we build it. This is going to take a while. Uh, any any other question? Yes. Yeah, a, a, a lot of um, DC power going into the into that you know the wire that the trolley rode on. Were there were there incidents with all that juice up above, the tragedies and that sort of thing? Yes and no. Uh, there was one thing, there, some kind of a story came out, I think it was the horse car people must have put that out, they're saying that your watches are going to be magnetized and therefore they'll be ruined. 
Uh, but there was one problem was the return track goes through, the uh, return current goes through the rails that are on the ground. And if the joints in the rails are not perfect, you'll end up with a leakage of electricity. And it did interfere with phone companies because telephones also grounded. So they, were, they had to make sure that the tracks were well welded together. Well, all right. And there is, and you notice it says Laconia Car Company on it, honest test run. That took only about three years to do. This car was much faster. Okay? Now what? She's, she's working on it. <laughs> yes? I have a question about uh, uh, the, the uh, distance between the rails. Is the same as ordinary rail train, railroad trains? Yes, they could. Yeah. Generally. They're the same. Yes, generally they were the same. If you went over to uh, Glasgow, Scotland, they're just slightly different to prevent, uh, and, and also Baltimore and Philadelphia, so that railroad cars wouldn't go down the street. Yeah. But the Atlantic Shore uh, did go, have everything running on the street as well as out in the country. Okay? How fast would that car go? This one? Yeah. Uh, 15 miles an hour. Mostly just needed the oomph. Okay. How long do they expect it to last to stay in service? What? How long do they expect the car to last to stay in service? Oh, uh, last after finishing service? So on a new car, how long would they expect it to, you know? Well, I think they probably may wanted maybe 20 years and they would be very happy over that. But in the museum, we have cars that we've had for 75 years. See, in a museum. I remember that when we got a car, this was the first car was from Glasgow, and it had been, uh, we had collected it after they, or built, it was built after our museum was founded, and it's showing its age. <laughs> All right, we made it, let's see if we can get it back. Here's another car, a lightweight metal car from Wheeling, West Virginia, built by the Cincinnati Car Company kind of eaten out here and there. See, this, this one was built of very thin material that didn't last at all. But they didn't care. They were done with it. They'd already given this to a dentist who put all his out-of-date medicines in there for storage rather than <laughs> turning them into the police department the way we do. <laughs> yeah, but we have built all that you see there we have created using the old steel as, uh, as a pattern. Yeah. There's the uh, seat backs, the... Uh, Met Rattan. We've done uh, well over 200 seats uh, we have built. Uh, pretty much the same order, okay? And that's what they look like. They, they used to have them on the cushions, but women caused them to be uh, changed to uh, vinyl seats. And the reason why is because their nylons got torn on the hook down the <laughs> Rattan. You must have had experience with that. You're nodding your head. <laughs> Okay, and that's the seat. We had no design for that seat. I did know that you can see a screw way over. That one screw told me all I needed to know because we had photographs, and that screw told me how high to make the seat, and the rest of it was all experience. And there's some of the oddballs uh, that work, have a family that work on streetcars. Maybe you know the one in red. <laughs> My daughter, who's the English teacher in Joliet, Illinois. My granddaughter. Uh, is from China, adopted, and uh, tell me if all Chinese people are as good as she is, we, we have good friends in China. <laughs> and uh, my son, who uh, worked there over 30 years ago, and his, uh, and my grandson, and my, uh, one, there's two significant others in there. Okay, enough of that. Yes. <laughs> a car from Washington and a car from uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. We try to have ads on the outside to add a period interest, okay? This is from Cleveland. Some of the trolleys are built almost like a canoe upside down. And we had, as we did do with the Narcissus, you'll see, we had to uh, replace the whole roof. This is steel roof ribs. The Narcissus is wood. Okay? He'll, this fellow has come to the museum I don't know how many summers over the last 50 years that I've known him. And he'll be here in a little while and say, what can I do to help you? Okay? This is a tro trolley motor built by Westinghouse, okay. This is the car that you just saw. One of, it's a huge car, but it was kind of fun to see it when it actually moved, okay. And this is, the cars are sponsored generally by 
people of high moral character, <laughs> I mean that, and uh, who are interested in seeing trolleys operate. And uh, we have, they're sponsored, many of them by people of small incomes, but great interest. And one of them is Fred Maloney, who's a uh, bald-headed fellow in the middle of going around sh think, shaking hands with people who had given money to the project. Okay? And here it is coming back. There's the fender to keep people out of the way. So let the restoration begin. Here is Phil unfolding, unveiling the tarpaulin with the narcissus. And there it is inside of our shop. Some of these will be sort of duplicates. We had, at one summer, we had some really, really good uh, draftsmen who uh, drew all these little pictures, which now, years later, we're coming back to as we make the various pieces. This is as you would look at it from the visitor's gallery. Since then, we've discovered all of the tongue and groove woods which form the sheathing of that car have uh, the nails have rusted in place and rusted off. So we've had to take the whole roof off. Just as looking at it from the side there, you can just barely see the piece that Phil held up, the arches, okay? We have to duplicate this. It's about eight feet long this high. We have to, we do quite a bit of steam bending, and it's going to be interesting to make a second one just like that for the other end of the car. And here we are hauling something out of the steam box, bending it around. This is ash we use, by the way, which bends very well. It's very tough wood, but very flexible. And we have to push it around with all our might, okay, and then clamp it in. Phil doesn't always look quite as, as spiffy as that, but he's always working. Okay. And this is taken a couple of days ago. The problem is the, uh, the ribs are about this far apart from each other. So you go up and turn yourself, and guess what you have? Stop. You can't get down. <laughs> <laughs> There's the state, uh, one of, that's the stained glass woman of Sun, Sun Dancers, I guess is the name of it and a couple of our very interested members. Okay. That's our foreman, Randy. Okay. Here we are getting, we, for demonstration purposes, at one of the Teddy Roosevelt days, we put all the glass in the upper part and a couple of the lower windows and then had it so the light was on behind it. And it really makes the car beautiful. Okay. That's fitting the, the windows in. Okay. And there's that piece. We weren't the, uh, all of the streetcars were not totally immune to damage, and that's one uh, that was being fixed up. They took it down to the Portland Railroad shops. That was the name of the streetcar company there. Okay. And here's how it would happen if you put it back together. Lots and lots of pieces of ash. Okay. This is the size of the, the cable that the main current goes through is about this big in one conductor. And there's some of your exfoliation. We are going to be taking the bottom out of the car. We jack the roof up. Now we're going to lower the bottom down and make a new one and then put it back. Supposedly they're going to let me work on the roof while the other crew is working underneath it. We'll see if I get up there on the roof, get locked in between in there. I'll be forever. There, the car is held together from top to bottom by these tie rods. Some of them, some of them go this way, but these are holding the, the corner posts together. All right, <coughs> and that's my grandson learning how to use a magnetic drill. Okay, and this is just a list of all the different kinds of things that you would find. One of the things we look for is square head bolts. That's what they had in those days. If they had hex head, they were very rough looking things, but. Uh, Lag screws, square head. Iron screws, not, not steel, but iron, and the iron screws tend to snap. They also rust pretty easily. Cast iron, Laconia cast iron foundry here. Uh, I think we just missed them on helping us out. Because I don't believe that exists anymore, does it? No. So we, we use a cast iron, which we get in, in Lewiston. All right? This is how we find important pieces. That's, uh, we have to replace this whole area, you'll see in a second, in the front of the car, and that's a pattern we have. 
This is uh, up in the near the roof of the car, and this is what raccoons will do with when they live in a streetcar. Look at the what's the significance of that piece of those pieces that you can't get at Home Depot today? Water sign. Yeah, the grain. Close. Those are annual rings. You in the same size piece nowadays, you might get five or six annual rings, and the thing is about made of a newspaper. Okay. <laughs> There's the square head bulbs. We use them over again if we can. That's a rusty tie rod that goes through the car horizontally. Okay. And that's what it looked like. It. But Phil happens to have a good connection. Okay. He brings these wonderful kids over from Thornton Academy where he works and puts them to work. And they don't know how good it is that what's being done for them because they, they, they work hard all day long. You can see he's very happy over that. <laughs> but this is the results of the work. We do that to hundreds of bolts. All right. This is a caster, casting that goes up, over, and down. And it was either made in Concord or in, Lan in Laconia. The, uh, the window sills and the window posts are co covered with copper flashing, and we have to replace all that. Somebody got a little bit ahead, though, on they took the whole thing out. That's all soldered together in one piece. I don't know. Phil took it out one day. I, I, it wasn't quite what I expected, but he also did it in a, in a very careful manner. But we have to reproduce that. It's going to be kind of fun. And getting ready to take the roof, roof sheathing off, okay? The car roof is held up by this thing called a carlin, C-A-R-L-I-N-E. This is a compound carlin because there'll be wood sandwiching it, then going up over the top through another sandwich and down the other side of the car. That gives it stiffness, okay? That's what it looks like, okay? The car has 600 volt lighting in it. That the way they get that is they put five bulbs in a string. Five times 12 gives you 600. And uh, Mr. Valley had a 110 volt house. Well, how did he make it work? He ran an extra wire all along. The white wire was Mr. Valley's wire and then put it back into the original light uh, fixtures. If we were to put, it, put power into it the way he gave it to us, it would blow up because it would be too much voltage. But now we have to take out half the wires and run a a series circuit, okay? This gentleman is, uh, he, he's uh, out of work, and he came to us the other day. He's an engineer, airplane pilot, knows just about anything and will answer just about any question we have in constructing the car. Uh, one of the things was how to come up with the type of finish that the car had on the inside. We discovered that they weren't varnished, they were shellacked. So he's mixing up some flake shellac, and I couldn't, it was a garnet, which is a dark color, you'll see in a minute. Uh, I was trying to find some, I couldn't find any anywhere, and I was most surprised that Rockler, the sort of a Home Depot of, of uh, wood hobby stuff, had it right in stock nearby South Portland, and you went and got it for me, thank you. And there it is, shaken up. The right hand is, no, move. Okay. This is unfinished, sanded, and the right hand is about five coats of shellac. It goes on quite rapidly, but you can see it's right into that wood. Unfortunately, with 4175, we didn't know about it, so we did it with hard work, elbow grease, and wax. Okay? And we needed to have a piece that would go right around the front of the car, so we needed a compass. There's a 140-foot, 140-inch, compass, which you're going to draw around this so we can have a form for our uh, roof, roof rafter, wood rafters. This was uh, one of the rusted out I-beams under the car that, that heads, well, you'll see what happens to it. We're going to cut it off. There's all those close rings we saw. That, now we're going to drill out and we're going to put special flathead carriage bolts. Flathead carriage bolts are not easy to get. So what do you do with them? You take a regular one and you pound it hard as you can and take a flathead carriage bolt out of it and drive them in here and then put nuts on them and that holds the whole thing together. All right? And
and this we made all of the siding for the outside. That's one of our neighbors who uh, came over every day and helped us out. This is the curtain window shade that they had. This type of pattern, I don't know whether we can get or not, but the cars all had shades that they would pull down. Okay. The floor, this is fascinating stuff. This, move a, one or two ahead. Yeah, you can see a little closer. That's hard rubber interlock cut so that, so that they all thumb together like a big puzzle. And that's a couple of the individual pieces. I don't know quite where we're going to get it, but I, by looking on the internet, we discovered a man by the name of Furness who designed railroad stations in the Baltimore, Philadelphia, Richmond area. All the bathrooms in his railroad stations had that kind of a, t of a fitting inside. So this is Furness tile, rubber tire, and parts of interlock. Let's, this is the ste steam co uh, steamboat Ticonderoga. How many people have been on that? Have you looked down? Did you recognize that? The whole floor of that deck is that way. And that was done by uh, uh, Armstrong Linoleum, and they were uh, much thinner. This uh, color and location clues in the floor. There are no seats in the Narcissus when he got it. There was just open. But we found this right here. The seat had a pedestal shaped like that. What color was the floor? It was green. What color was the floor around it? Tile red. So little details come up. And it's amazing. Sometimes you're looking at something for hours, and then all of a sudden. These are ceiling panels, which are what they call three-ply veneer. And the veneer on the surface was birch, and that the uh, design is gold leaf. This, that's, uh, the roof was either white or painted Nile green. This particular area was Nile green, and then whatever was on it shrank. There probably was varnish on there. You're going to see lots of beautiful mahogany, which does refinish in. Much of it is in pretty good shape. We're, we're lucky to have as many as we do. Okay. Notice the inlay. It's three straight strips of uh, holony, ebony for black, and holly for white into little grooves all over all the panels on the car. And if we're real careful and don't get it wet, we'll be able to preserve that. There's another, another one. That just shows a seat that went up. This, these are wainscoting. Okay, that's all right. We, okay. And oh, yeah, this fellow was old enough to remember riding the black cars. That's what he, because the Narcissus was so dark.